Before we get into it, I need to say this important disclaimer. A guest today makes serious allegations that are solely his own opinion. Neither I nor BlockWorks necessarily agree with these claims, some of which are unverified or unverifiable, and in no way do we endorse them. Nevertheless, an important part of learning is having conversations with people who you disagree with, so rather than censor anybody, we decided to let you, the viewer, draw your own conclusions. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy this interview. I am joined by Kyle Bass, founder and chief investment officer of Heyman Capital Management, and Nick Glinsman of Malmgren Glinsman and Partners. Gentlemen, great to have you both here. I want to start by just asking you, what is your general outlook for 2023? What do you think the investment landscape will look over the next year? Kyle, let's start with you and then Nick. Uh, of course I get to start. Uh, <laughs> well, Jack, uh, look, I believe that um, you've only recently begun to see the Fed pull uh, liquidity out of the system, right? Try to shrink their balance sheet. And I think it's important to remember where the balance sheet started and, and, and how, 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 how much it expanded and where we got to. Uh, I think that, you know, just prior to the global financial crisis in 08, the Fed's balance sheet was only about $900 billion. Uh, and that was on a GDP of roughly 17 trillion going into the global financial crisis. And now uh, go as, as we approached the, 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 the virus emanating from Wuhan, whether it emanated from a lab or some zoonotic transmission that no one's been able to find, I guess, won't be a topic of conversation here. But uh, at the end of 2019, the Fed's balance sheet had, had, had expanded to 4.1 trillion. So it had gone from 900 billion to 4.1 trillion. And then in an 18 month time frame, it went from 4.1 trillion to just under 9 trillion. We have never expanded the balance sheet at that rate. Uh, uh, and we added roughly 40% more broad money to the system called M2. And uh, I'm a monetarist at heart, and I don't buy that whole IOER neutralization that the economists of the world buy. You put 40% more money in the system, and you're going to see roughly 40% inflation, which whether you look at rents, whether you look at real estate, whether you look at services, I'm telling you, we saw 40% inflation. We saw 18% inflation in apartment rents two years in a row. So uh, that's what I think happened. Uh, and I think that the Fed's desire Number one, they started in the wrong place. They started aggressively hiking rates without any other central bank moving along with us. Now, it would have been much more impactful if we called the BOE, the BOJ, the, the ECB, uh, and, and even the PBOC and said, hey, we're all going to raise rates 75 bips and we're going to give a joint press release saying we are going to kill inflation. But the other players couldn't afford to do it. So we went on our own. We went first. Uh, and we actually just... What we should have done is try to shrink the Fed's balance sheet first and not raise rates first. That's my own opinion. Uh, and instead, we aggressively raised rates. It takes nine to 12 months for these rate hikes to really work their way into the economy. And we're just now only starting to reduce $95 billion a month from the Fed's balance sheet. My own guess, and maybe Nicholas does want to take the over under on this one. <laughs> I think we'll get to like a trillion, a trillion one, maybe off the balance sheet before we have to stop. I think we're permanently at a seven trillion dollar balance sheet or more, unfortunately. And I'll I'll stop there by saying we're going to be reducing the Fed's balance sheet from now into 2023 until we can't reduce it anymore. That is not going to provide um, positive financial conditions to the market. You've seen the curve invert by over 80 basis points in the twos and the tens. The bond market is almost always right, and I'm going to say it is right here. We're going to see an aggressive, sharp recession. Um, and then the Fed's going to be cutting rates by the end of next year. And I've said that all along, even in my bet with Nicholas. So I, I stand by that uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That is That will not be a positive environment for stocks per se, although there'll be plenty that do well. And, and one space that I think is uh, a generational buying opportunity here is energy and its pullback. I think we've seen we've done nothing to solve the supply side crisis. All we've done is double down on our virtue signaling and green energy, which today as we speak, I guess today's December 12th, we have seen as high as 5,000 pounds per megawatt hour in the UK. Just think about that number for a second. In the US, we're paying roughly $130 a megawatt hour. Uh, this Actually, when you think about that, 
the big problem in the UK. You've got the problem of France not being able to export because of their nuclear maintenance. That's the typical maintenance of the French. Um, but in the UK, a th- up to a third of electricity comes from wind. There, yeah. there ain't no wind. <laughs> What's renewables doing for the situation, right? I um, mean, the, the inmates have been running this asylum. And Nicholas and I agree, I think, wholeheartedly on global energy policy. It's crazy to put a third of your baseload power relying on wind when a, cold, a Arctic cold front comes through. There's no wind and you have seven days of crazy temperatures. Yeah. This could break people. It could break people, it could break companies, and it can ultimately break uh, economies again, like COVID did. Um, and, and Nick, yeah, so did you have a view on whether the global slowdown, which I, I think both of you um, see going forward, will be sufficient to destroy demand for natural gas, oil, coal, uh, if if the supplies are constrained? Uh, Nick, you can take that, or as well as I want to hear your general 2023 outlook that, that Kyle gave. Do I think demand will be constrained? I'm not, I, I don't think it's a pro- actually, funnily enough, it's not a problem necessarily of demand in terms of the price. It's a problem of supply. I mean, I was thinking whilst Carl was talking, you know, some of the, the uh, they haven't got, they can't, for example, where's the SPR left? And I'm not just talking about the US, I'm talking, and that, they've all got to be replenished. So what was used to try and alleviate the supply issue and the, primarily the price issue, that those gaps and deficits now have to be replenished. Let's see. I mean, the whole crazy thing about this renewable energy, I'm not against renewable energy. Um, I'm not against sustainable energy, but they did this without a transition plan, which was illogical. Uh, the, the, what I'm thinking, what we're thinking, and I've been doing a lot of work and contemplation with, so I'm now working with Harold Malmgren, as you intimated, um, and, and we have a couple of other partners coming on board shortly. We, we our first big introductory piece, which, which will be, look, we will look at the situation of money supply, both US and globally, relative to the balance sheets, relative to credit impulse, and look for other cu- clues. We think money supply is collapsing. We're looking at money supply, narrow money supply as a guide, but what we're looking at in the US for real indications is banks balances at the Federal Reserve. It's obviously correlated. That has pretty much collapsed um, this since the end of since Q3, Q4 of 21 to date. Um, we think it's got more to go, and we think it will get down to a level uh, in in March or Q2 of next year, which will create the environment for a credit crunch. Now that credit crunch, as you and I were just talking before Carl came on. Uh, I think it's more likely that the impact of that will be in Europe. But if it were to be an impact in the US, I think it could be the small regional banks. I think the money center banks are in real, really good shape. The small regional banks, so Kansas City banks are exposed to the shale oil companies. And all these small, small regional banks seem to be exposed, obviously, to the local real estate market. And we know what's happened to the local real estate market. So if there was a credit crunch in the U.S. that had a negative impact on the economy, you will see it manifest itself with the small regional banks. And we think there's going to be a rather significant trade there. Going over to Europe, um, it can be anywhere. But, you know, in Europe, as well as the U.S., watch the shadow banks. Uh, Remember the LDI situation, the shadow banks were the other side of the trade. And that was just, you know, toe dipping in the water. Uh, I think Europe's got some horrendous um, exposures. And, I, you know, I've noticed that European banks have actually um, rallied somewhat uh, recently. I can't for the life of me think why. Um, I think the sovereign debt doom loop increased during COVID because the bank guarantees cor- corporates. The bank loans to corporates under COVID in continental Europe, we're all guaranteed by the governments. So there's an increase. And as, again, something I was aff- referring to earlier, maybe a bit too micro, but I don't think it is. Um, so the, the constitutional court, German constitutional court last week, ruled the EU recovery fund fine, but they put a whole load of subconditions in there. That means any joint issuance by the EU 
has to come out of own sources and cannot be very big. It has a, a limited size. And that mm -hmm. means the EU can never get over that hurdle, the Hamiltonian hurdle. You're not going to get that fiscal union. Okay? Um, so there, there, there should be pressures on the spreads. I think there will be pressures on the European banks, which are basically all bankrupt. And I wonder, given the behavior of Germany lately with going their own way on the energy prices, going their own way with China, trying to preserve their economic model of trade surplus, trade surplus, trade surplus, I, I think it would be Germany that could be the ones that say, okay, enough. Thank you, Nick. Kyle, just going over to you. Uh, so in 2022, America has been an outlier in, you know, the economy has not been strong in the US, but it has been much less weak than the economy of Europe and China in particular. In 2023, do you could expect that to continue to be the case? Or do you think, uh, you know, Europe and China right now are at the bottom of economic activity, so they have only up to go and, and US is going down, even though it's from a, a higher level? Uh, and then, you know, Nick said a lot of interesting things that I'm, I'm sure you can respond to as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with response to Nick, I, but I agree with him wholeheartedly on the fact that I've always said, number one, Europe doesn't have a central tasking authority. They don't have a unified fighting force. And the European Union is still just an idea. Uh, and that's an experiment that's going to fail. And I've, I've always said that I think Germany will just take a step back as opposed to someone else stepping across the line like, you know, Grexit or Frexit or whatever you want to talk about. I think uh, Germany going from like an 8% of, of GDP current account surplus to maybe going negative on their current account because of their uh, bad energy bets and being sold to Russia back in 2005 and, you know, worsening all along. I think Germany has kind of sealed the coffin of the European Union ideology. And, and I agree with Nicholas on and how-, can, how can, can I add work. one thing to that just quickly? If we go down the typical route of austerity, austerity, austerity in the European Union, you know what the other countries are going to turn around and say to the Germans, because this energy crisis is all on them, period. Yeah. As are several other issues that abound. Sorry, Carl, back to you. But again, back to that point, the energy crisis will actually be the tipping point, right? You, you, can't, you can't increase energy costs 8 to 10x on the consumers and expect anyone to kind of stay together. Uh, so you're going to see what you've seen immediately. <laughs> Imagine the response so far has been price caps, subsidies, and no supply response. So you have, you have literally complete idiots running the EU. Like that is no long-term solution to a supply problem. And if nuclear is the answer, which I think it is, I think small modular nuclear is the answer. We have a 10-year duration mismatch right now. So things are going to break before that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I wanted to respond to Nicholas's comments on Europe. And this dovetails into, Jack, your question about U.S. China. Look, the answer is yes. The U.S. will be stronger than China, will be stronger than Europe, because they have, they have uh, architectural problems. Uh, the problem with China has, has been what has been responsible for the meteoric rise is, is riverboat gambling in their property sector. Their property sector is almost 40% of their GDP. And what she figured out about, about a year ago, when median home prices got to be 36 times or more median incomes in tier one cities, um, <laughs> just to put things into perspective, in the US, median home price got to be just over six times median income when our subprime crisis collapsed. So. They are six times worse. Their banking system is almost four times more levered than ours. They're reliant, 40% of their economy is reliant on, on, uh, on real estate expansion. And what she figured out is the average birth rate of the average Chinese woman uh, has dropped from over 2.1 to now 1.2. And you ask why, why would that be? Well, because the men that graduate university can't afford to buy a house. So they go live with their parents they can't have sex. They can't marry in the basement of their parents' house. So they don't. So the birth rate started collapsing on, we all know the demographic curve of China looks terrible because of the one China policy, but this supercharged the problem. So what she did is decided to squash real estate. He knows it has to come down and stay down. That's why every single Western lender into a Chinese real estate firm is gonna get something that rhymes with hero in return. Uh, <laughs> And the domestic 
lenders and, and owners will get some sort of pittance, 10, 20 cents on the dollar, just so that they don't completely lose their minds. But the real estate sector in China is not going to bounce. So right. and, yeah, that, that's, ahead, that's where I come out at the end of your question. Yeah. Thanks, right. Kyle. And it, um, just, uh, Nick, I want to bring you in, but just Kyle, real quickly, sort of, uh, Xi, he want, he's, this problem of housing is way too expensive. The economy is way too financialized. The demographics are, are, are very not, not able to, to meet that demand. So I, I get what you're saying. His strategy is to deflate the real estate bubble. But aren't there tons of uh, knock on effects uh, of doing this where you know, real estate prices have collapsed? Many firms are insolvent. There have to be state owned enterprise, uh, you know, shadow bailout, bailouts, mortgage defaults. Uh, you have people protesting uh, that they still have to pay mortgage on a property that hasn't been built yet. The Chinese stock market has collapsed. Uh, at what point do the Chinese authorities come in and say, hey, OK, we've deflated the bubble a little bit, but let's not have a revolution on our hands, not to mention zero COVID. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so great question. So um, when you think about China, Jack, you have to think about it in two completely separate spheres. One is their domestic marketplace that's RMB driven, driven by the Chinese Communist Party. And the other one is their interface with the rest of the world. So to your point, what you're saying, Jack, from what I think you're saying is that they're going to have to completely abandon moral hazard and just bail out everybody uh, in the RMB based economy. Well, that's 100 percent true. Uh, and I think when they do so, they will print as many RMB as they have to print to, to fill the holes that they need to fill. Uh, now, you know, she has continued to uh, choose politics over economics, even even after uh, this last uh, 20 Congress. Uh, and, and, and just at this most recent meeting uh, that they had, uh, the Politburo uh, is intensifying its calls for party discipline exactly. on anti-corruption. They're uh, obsessed. They're obsessed. And, and really come after them yeah. uh, will shape and weigh on any kind of potential stimulative effects of the economy. They are going to hammer the excessive wealth of China. And that's, I, I think they have to do that to keep Technology the Technology and the finance sector is suffering that's now as well. Exactly right. I mean, so, it's funny, we haven't been speaking, Jack, but what we were talking about earlier. Right. <laughs> so, you know, the, the party has, has basically unequivocally asserted its primacy over economics. Yeah. That happened in, that happened at the 20th Party Congress. It continues to happen. Now, can China manufacture some sort of uh, market bounce or manufacture market confidence by pretending that they're going to open up? Of course they can. I mean, I'm sure you saw uh, uh, today uh, Li Keqiang uh, uh, trancing around with the OECD, World Bank, IMF folks, at, like it was 1999 and he wasn't wearing a mask. I don't know if you saw this, but yeah, I did see that. Did the see key that. officials are really starting to signal, okay, we're just going to back down from zero COVID and we're going to open. Everything's going to be fine. I'm just telling you, it's, this is not going to happen. And sorry, Kyle, why is that? Because China extremely strict policy that hampered growth for, for basically since the origin. Um, yeah. And now I didn't see that news out, but I did see a, a news of Chinese public health officials say that, oh, the death rate of Omicron of COVID is similar to the flu, only 0.1 percent. And that is definitely a dovish you know, stance on Omicron. Why do you think that China will go back to zero COVID because cases will rise or or what do you, why do you think that? OK, do you want you want me to say something? That I that I've held back from saying all along. Say it, but, say, say it. it. Come on, say <laughs> it. it. <laughs> people are gonna people are gonna think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I'm gonna I'm gonna get them to the data. So, um, number one, I'll just make a quick comment about your last comment about uh, you know the 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 death rates and, and not being worse than the flu and everything's gonna be fine. Um, the official death rate of the Tiananmen Square uh, disturbance is still zero from the Chinese Communist Party. It's not. 10,000 plus students run over with tanks and wash down the drains with fire hoses. So be careful if you if you really want to believe the Chinese Communist Party's numbers, number one. Uh, number two, um, I believe now I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a science scientist. But what I am is a statistician and someone that knows how to look at numbers. So let me walk you through. Let me take you down a rabbit hole. That's super interesting. Go to the go to go to the WHO's website. And they're the, they're the global, would you agree that they're the global resource on COVID infections, deaths, recoveries, kind of writ large across the world? Absolutely. 
go to go the WHO's go the WHO's website. They have an Excel downloadable format for their data series, country by country, all over the world on COVID nineteen. So if you take the way that the groupings of the WHO's website work, um, you know they they run it by if if you look at Southeast Asia, um, that in, that happens to include India and and the Middle East, right? So if what you're trying to do is isolate a purely Asian genome, you take Southeast Asia, you subtract Middle Eastern countries, you subtract a India, and you add China. And one could argue that that's the best way you could isolate a pure Asian genome. And so when I did that and I looked at the number of infections, the number of recoveries, the numbers of deaths, while I was doing this exercise, something really interesting happened at the WHO on their website. One of the columns on the Excel spreadsheet was deaths per 100,000, which I'm sure you've all seen. That's super interesting because what that does is normalize the data, right? That normalizes the data against the population cohort. So it, it makes things more comparable, right? You can't, nominal number of deaths don't matter unless you know what the population is and do the, you know, the, the, the normalizing. So when I, when I looked at this, if you assumed a linear distribution of deaths across the world, um, you would you would have you would have achieved a number that was exactly ten times the number that the Asian genome produced. So one can say either the, the only thing you can infer from this data is one of two things. I'm going the number more of, negative inference. The number of deaths in Asia are dramatically understated by a factor of nine or ten. Or the disease is designed to affect different genomes in different ways. And I am a believer in the second uh, and the Agreed. latter. Statement. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Kyle, yeah, thank you. I just want to say that, you know, on, on this show, 99% of the time we talk about finance and I, you know, I'm generally equipped to, to so you know, if Nick said inflation in the U.S. is officially 12 percent i'd say oh no actually you know it was recently eight point something but i'm not a geneticist so i'm not able to uh fact check that at all and uh you well know, actually you don't have to you don't have to be a geneticist you just have to be able to download the the excel spreadsheet from the who and just walk through what i did and the numbers tell you everything you need to know well yeah well yeah i, I think uh china's data being uh less than accurate is that, that that's true in the economic sphere as well right yeah 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 um there but it go. may be Nick. accurate that's the whole point uh, i am be. getting a little hot so i am gonna i am just gonna uh go to my my west oh, east time west time west 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 <laughs> oh, okay. oh dear i love that t-shirt there we go <laughs> actually you owe me one of those t-shirts too don't you I, I will mail you one nicholas okay thank you uh, i'm such a schnorrer um you see, the interesting thing, coming back from that, and actually Harold's daughter wrote a substack about about exactly what Carl was just talking, so Pippa's, Pippa's substack. Uh, and that was after spending time with various military cadres in both the US and the UK. Um, but I think going back to Beijing, and, and there's two obsessions with Beijing. One, as Carl said, politics over economics. They are obsessed with avoiding the fate of the Soviet Union Communist Party. Obsessed. To the point where they were showing uh, an incredibly bad film to all, all, all over China to Communist Party members, CPC members. Um, they need, now, they do need to ensure improvement in the economy, given what we've just been through in terms of the protests on zero COVID. Um, but the interesting thing from last week's Politburo meeting is they came out, as we were discussing earlier, Jack, last, they came out and urged entrepreneurs, foreign investors, and local governors to rediscover their animal spirits. And it was the foreign investors side that really sparked an interest from both myself and Harold, and we've been digging into that. We can only assume that they don't have enough free cash for what they want to do, um, which could be either dollar debt stress across the system. Uh, I know that you know China's got reported balances, but if you look at what they came out and reported on gold, 
it's a lot less than, their gold reserves are a lot less than what people had thought, okay? So they, something's wrong there. And I, I, I think what, what's happening is the CCB is trying to manufacture market confidence. And it's quite risky because then this is where it takes me down to the more global macro view here, Kyle. Um, when Harold and I appeared on Jack's pod, pod uh, several months ago, Howard was very insistent that we were at the beginning of poor economic growth, i.e. deceleration for China, which could last decades. Okay? Uh, they seem to have skipped the middle income trap. And that's not good. Um, now, it can be accentuated further by the geopolitical drivers going on, deglobalization, um, CFIUS, but also what's rumored to be the reverse CFIUS coming out in the U.S., and which is where the foreign investors bit sort of, I couldn't put the two together. They know this reverse CFIUS is coming out. The question is whether it's going to affect the finance sector. Uh, although everybody seems to be pulling up, you know, there seems to be some firings and uh, letting go of staff in the foreign banks in China. I still think the key, the key uh, point will be the moment HSBC is forced to split. That's the key sig signal. Um, and it will be forced to split. Uh, but, you know, if they go through a situation where they have weak cons domestic consumption, to spur growth, real estate, forget it. They're just creating a bottom. They're not creating a dead cap balance. Infrastructure is pushing on a string. They've done it, been there, seen it. How many bridges to know where can they build? Um, so the domestic consumer, they're very dependent on the domestic consumer. Trouble is, I don't think the domestic consumer can help spur the growth they need to keep people happy. So we're expecting, and this is a Keteris Paribus situation here, Carl, we're expecting that the Chinese at some point, once it's really fully opened, everybody's saying, yes, commodities are going to go up. Yes, sir, that will be the initial spur. They want to flood the West with exports. And they're going to be flooding the West with exports with the renminbi at around seven uh, and competing with the Japanese at around 137 and a half, the South Koreans at 1307. So you're looking at much depreciated currencies and major volume coming down the pipeline. Now, if, if an accident doesn't occur between now and, you know, and next, the end of next year, you will see deflation being exported by the Chinese. Good for the bond markets, great for the inflationary outlook. Absolutely could stop, certainly stop central banks raising rates, whether they'll start cutting rates until they see three, four months of continuous decline. But that would be something um, that the central banks would welcome. However, our fear is that this impact of money supply growth and bank reserves, and you can look at the equivalent of TL, TRO in Europe, is of such a rapid descent that we're not far off in terms of time, and I'm talking one or two quarters, whereby there's something else is going to break. We've had two break, breaks of significance, LDI in the UK and Blackstone's real estate business, and they are the biggest of the biggest. They could make the market, but they, 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 they got caught. Um, so I, they depend on foreign consumers remaining healthy. If they don't, boy, uh, it, is the global economy in trouble? Just, just to play advocate, uh, devil's advocate, Nick, uh, sure. why couldn't the Chinese government do what the American government did in March and April of, of 2020 and just do uh, a giant stimulus plan that stimulates consumer demand? With, with the, I think the Chinese uh, consumer price index is still below where it was in 2019. So you've had effectively three years of deflation um, even though it's been going up since 2020. But there's there's a lot of room for stimulus, uh, uh, no? Nick yeah. first and then Kyle. My thought is there is a lot of room for stimulus. My question is why haven't they done it? They had a perfect excuse for zero COVID to quell that frustration, that long-term. I mean, think of how long Shanghai was in lockdown. They didn't do it. It's, it's politics over economics. It's control over the wealth. Well, I think control over everything, right? And 
They don't want to be forced in a, into a position. They also don't want to be seen, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, and this is all, to, you can see this with the vaccine approach. I don't think they want to be seen doing what the rest of the world is. She's made this, what's gone on with COVID, we do it better. We do everything better. Stick with the CCP. And I think that stimulus. And finally, I go back to this point about foreign investors. Why did they, why did they single out foreign investors to rediscover their animal spirits? Why? That made no sense to me. And you've got to link it, I think, well, to it makes, other areas. It, it, it makes perfect sense, Nicholas. So look, again, I'm going to go back to the way that the, the way that the Chinese Communist Party works is they take their weakness and they try to turn it into strengths uh, in their in their propaganda machine. So when you look at, you know, uh, uh, Jack, I don't know if you read the, uh, the IMF Article 4 reviews on, on IMF member countries that, that are done annually. But uh, back in 2019, you know, the IMF has something that they call reserve adequacy. When you look at reserve adequacy, it takes into account the size of your economy, the size of your imports, your exports, uh, and it takes into account your short-term debt, your medium-term debt, your long-term debt. What it, what the IMF Reserve Adequacy Formulary is is an attempt to determine is the way you think about it is it's it's the working capital needs of a sovereign, okay? Uh, because if you're a sovereign that's doing tons of importing and exporting and you need dollars running your economy, because again, the Chinese economy, it faces the rest of the world, 85, 86% of their settlements are in dollars. So they need desperately dollars to deal with the rest of the world. Yeah. They import their food every day. They import their energy every day. They enter, in, import basic materials, base metals every day. So dollars are, are very important. So in 2019, the reserve adequacy formulary just disappears from the Chinese Article 4 review and the Hong Kong Article 4 review. No longer comes up. That's out. right. We were looking for Hong Kong at that time, weren't we? Gone, we could, right? It's gone. Yeah, now, yeah. That's super interesting in its own right. But yeah. when you think about this, that number, a working capital number, if your revenues are moving up as a company, your working capital number has to move up, okay? Uh, if you're a, an import exporter and, and global player. So the reserve ad adequacy formulary output number has certainly needed to move higher over time. Now, what you see with China is they now own less than a trillion of treasuries. They say they have $3 trillion of dollar reserves, and they promised when they ascended into the IMF SDR, they promised within two years that they would fully disclose uh, the composition of their reserves. Haven't done it yet. Now, my view is think back to 1998. 1998, we had already in, in July, on July 2nd of 97 is the day the Thai bot broke. Was it, was it uh, just a, a, a curious coincidence that it broke the day after? The British handed Hong Kong back to the Chinese. It wasn't. Money was running from Southeast Asia. The very next day, the Thai bot broke. Then you had the, the Asian financial crisis begin uh, kind of in mass in 97. In 98, you had the Russia default. You had EMs blowing up because uh, the dollar was really increasing in value. I mean, I know it, it rhymes a lot with what we're seeing now. But in 98, you remember Larry Summers was a Treasury Secretary. One day, Larry, Larry gets a call. The call comes in and it's the finance minister of Korea. And now Korea in 98 was the 800 pound gorilla in Asia. They had the most dollar reserves of anyone in Asia. They were solid. They were rock solid. It was the peripheral Southeast Asian economies that were falling like flies. We didn't worry about South Korea because they had a mountain of reserves. So the finance minister calls Larry and says, hey, Larry, we have a problem. Larry says, well, I've got a lot of problems. What, what could your problem be? Everything looks fine. And, and the finance minister said to Larry, he said, you know what? Uh, we're kind of out of dollars. And Larry says a couple of expletives and says, what do you mean? And they said, well, we show this pile of reserves, but we've lent those to our banks. and Our banks have sold them to defend the Korean won. And so we technically don't have them anymore. We really need a big dollar loan. So the reason I bring that up is you look at China, you look at their diminution of reserves, their their lack of ownership of treasuries. They want to make it sound like it's weaponized and that China is going to hurt us by selling treasuries. But it is their weakness. They are in a desperate need for dollars. Their current account was headed towards zero. Now, let me let me make one more connection that that maybe needs to be made. When you look at their current account and you look at their capital account and you look at what was happening prior to covid, it was collapsing down below zero. You know why? Because oil prices were high 
And the Chinese population kind of writ large, what do they do when they get a little bit of money? The first thing they do is they get on an airplane and they leave and they send their kids to university. There were 440,000 Chinese kids in U.S. universities in 2019, 440,000. And they pay their bills in cash. So you look at the not Chinese America. This is Chinese. Chinese. These are F, these are Chinese nationals in yeah, yeah, U.S. Yeah. universities. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the number, they were spending China Inc. was spending four hundred billion dollars a year in dollars uh, money. When the Chinese travel to Europe, they travel to Asia, they travel to the U.S. They can't spend RMB because no one takes it. Right. They still have a closed capital yeah. account. So they spend dollars, euros, yen, pounds, but it's mostly dollars. Uh, so those dollars were leaving the system in mass. And what they were doing to offset that is corrupting MSCI and Bloomberg, trying to get those passive pipes put in for dollars to be Shang- called Shang- uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai Connect. Uh, a, yeah. Hong Kong, Shanghai Connect, but also the, the inclusion in the MSCI indices and, and the, uh, the Bloomberg Lehman indices are, are very important. So it's my view. Again, this is going to sound hyper conspiratorial, but it's my view that you had this scenario where China was reaching the end of its rope. Their current account was going negative. There were more Chinese people than ever flying all over the world and spending all over the world. And at the exact same time, the Hong Kong protests were at their zenith at the end of 2019. And what happened? Magically, a disease, a virus showed up in the perfect time to save their current account and to allow them to move into Hong Kong without tanks and guns. It happened perfectly. Coincidence, Jack, and I can see you having a wry smile there, but there are a lot of coincidences relative to the economics. So Um, I, I don't believe they're ever going to allow China to fully reopen. I don't believe they're going to allow their population to travel as freely as they traveled once before. If you listen to Xi and you listen to him in his own words, in the, in the Politburo exit, uh, you'll see that his focus is on internalizing everything. It is on the reunification of the great Chinese race, which means China, Taiwan, and he is battening down the hatches. I don't think that he will ever reopen because that he can't afford his current account to bleed again. So again, this is a setup for war. He's installed a war cabinet. He's removed every technocrat from the markets that were there. He removed the head of the PBOC, Yi Gang. He removed the head of the CSRC. He removed uh, the finance minister. He dropped Li Hua out of the party. It's it's game time, guys. It's clear as day what's about to happen. Yeah. And so this is not going to be some opening balance and some Wall Street feel good. This yeah. is about to go horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let me just uh, yeah see, see a, a few statistics. So officially, the Chinese balance of trade, the current account, the trade – uh, deficit or trade surplus uh, for China has uh, over the past 20 years been very positive and they've been buying U.S. treasuries with that. So they've been a creditor of, of the United States. Uh, Correct. Those, But those holdings of U.S. treasuries peaked at, I think, uh, you know, a decade ago or something, they were at maybe 1.3 trillion and now they're just over 900 billion. Yeah. So your question, Kyle, is it's the same as my question, which is where did the money go? And when you said the thing about uh, Chinese nationals you know, sending their kids to US schools, you know, vacations in Europe, typically that would be caught up, I think, with the uh, current account, unless I'm wrong, because you know, tourism it is, is a quote, good. It is. Four, there's a $400 billion outflow in 2019. Mm. And don't think it's okay. slowing down right now. Singapore charges Chinese nationals a hundred million. You got to show you got a hundred million dollars to invest in Singapore, right? To get citizenship or residency. There's no shortage. There's not enough. There's, they just don't have enough space for the for the demand. It's it's just cranking up. And you know when you see that somebody like Jack Ma, formerly a CPC member, is living in Japan, Japan. A chi- Chinese former CPC member is living in Japan. You think of Japan, you know, think of the history books and what the contradiction of that alone is. Right, and uh, you know, to Kyle, to your credit, there was a time you were asking on Twitter publicly, "Where is Jack Ma?" And yeah. there was a time when that was considered a conspiracy theory. What? It's not oh, a conspiracy sure. anymore. Yeah. He's in Japan. Yeah. He's in Japan. Yeah. I mean, uh, guys, you just need to read enough books about how the CPC works and what they do and and look at what they do and stop listening to what they say. And and the writing is all on the wall. 100 percent of it is there in Xi's own words. Exactly. 
And it's a very different approach you need uh, to when you analyze Western central banks, where read what Powell says and not what the, everybody's interpreting it to be said. So, Carl's up, you've got to see what they do. They can sit, they speak with forked tongue, and that's not meant to be xenophobic or any. They, they'll say one thing, do another thing, and it's the doing that you've got to be very focused on. Very focused. I mean, I'm, I'm still in shock that the, the gold reserves were reported and were way less than what people had thought. How do these, how do these, um, these numbers, previous numbers, get out there and get such credibility? It's extraordinary. I mean, for, there's enough gold bugs. Jack, if you, look, if you look behind the scenes, first of all, she directed members of the Chinese Communist Party to, to divest of foreign assets. He did that in, in 2020, right? And then uh, they updated the, quote, foreign investment law, uh, which gives Beijing the power and ability to nationalize foreign assets under special circumstances, which include war. So they, 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 they set that up. And in mid-2021, uh, China released a law. It's called the C Counter Foreign Sanctions Law. If you are a corporation or individual that is simply complying with an external foreign sanction, your assets can be seized and you can be jailed. Do you, okay? know, what, do you know what's interesting about that is the second law that you mentioned about nationalizing foreign companies in a national emergency? Guess which organization, which group of countries has exactly the same law? Recently, European Union. Hmm. That's astonishing, isn't it? I, I didn't mean, know that. So, 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 Kyle, that uh, applies to Chinese domiciled companies. What about companies that have a lot of operations within China, such as Apple? They, they make you know, most or all Tesla, their uh, iPhones Tesla. there, as well as uh, companies that rely on the Chinese consumer base, like Tesla. They, they build Teslas in China, and uh, yeah. a lot of t Tesla's growth has, has relied upon that Chinese consumer. If, 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 like if, but look, that's look, it puts Musk in a really different, difficult spot. It puts Tim Cook in a difficult spot. I think Tim Cook, you know, he refused to ask, answer that reporter's questions, uh, Vaughn's questions in the halls of the maybe the Dirksen building where he was. And uh, uh, it, it really it really reflected poorly on on such a, quote, social justice warrior that he can't that he can't talk about social justice outside of his own country. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think Tim Cook's moving to India as fast as he can move to India. Basically, anyone that does business with China, uh, you know, has to, has to wear two faces. There's no way that you can be honest. But you know, the interesting aspect of this, you, we're talking Tesla, hence the automotive. There's gonna, corporations going to have to make a choice. Countries are going to have to make a choice. Are you, are you with the West or the, the liberal democracies? And I use liberal in the British meaning as opposed to the American meaning. Or are you with the, the CPC in China, right? Now, in the car industry, GM and Ford seem committed to China. Stellantis, on the other hand, is leaving no production there. They've pulled all their production. They're cutting it. They're going to do a local partnership for a cheap version of the Jeep uh, to be, be produced by a local partner. Now, that's interesting. Um, there, whereas BASF of Germany... It's just invested or is investing another 10 billion in more plants. This is all to do with that trade surplus model, which is coming to an end because of the poly crises and the various influences and decisions companies are going to have to make. Included in those companies are finance sector companies. What's interesting to me is now there is this fear about Taiwan and, and she pre prepping for war. Um, but I think. If that economy goes into a tailspin, he's going to have problems um, in, in, in creating that war environment, just as Putin has. now. But I think Putin's actually got some quite big uh, weapons at hand, which are not kinetic and not nuclear either. Uh, I was reading a piece in the FT or the Telegraph today. Europe's energy crisis, don't assume next year is going to be a, a walk in the park by comparison. Absolutely not. And um, he's playing that. He's also playing the fact that with this, the European consumer being absolutely crushed by inflation, regardless of the source of inflation, uh, he's playing that the idea that people will get fed up with the Ukraine war and will start to demonstrate we want the money. Why is it going over there? 
you're, you're already seeing him really influence the social media networks and and even the far right in the U.S. is like is buying this. Uh, so I think that uh, I, I think there's only one answer in the Ukraine war, and it's it is a full victory for Ukraine. There is no negotiated truce. There is no settlement where we give Putin half or whatever he's advanced on so far. He wants he wants total supremacy, and he and and we all know that Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and maybe Poland will be next. And the Western world gets this, and we must. Look, I'm a I'm an Austrian school uh, economist at heart, but I think the 60 billion dollars we're giving the Ukraine must keep being given, and we need to do everything we can to defeat uh, the tyrant uh, of Putin. I'm 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 a little bit I'm, I'm I agree with you entirely. It's just that I've spent my life doubting both Russians and Ukrainians, um, and and some of that those old regimes because. The corruption there. And it strikes me as, um, I just think we're going to see a lot of pressure. There's there's never been an off-ramp uh, for Putin, and hence the, the kinetic war. And if you go back to 2014, the previous Obama administration, all the same characters are involved right now. Um, yeah. And that, that's the worry as to how far this could go. The well, good news is she said agreed with Modi, no nuclear. We're not going to accept that. Well, wait, how does, how does that dovetail into his February 4th joint press release where it says the, there, are no, there, is a limit, there are no limits to a strategic partnership with Russia, including nuclear? I know. Well, I guess it dovetails because it's more recent. Now, the yeah. question then becomes is, what does, that re- what does that represent in terms of Xi's view of Modi and China? Well, you already, you've already seen clashes today exactly. of, of the Chinese and the Indians after she shook Modi's hand at the G20 summit. I mean, I know, I know. It's the crazy. of China knows no boundaries. No, and I, uh, I suspect that you'll see India and Japan, both of which are already five eyes adjacent, get closer and closer to the whole, that whole uh, you know, for India, it's a natural ex- extrapolation of its old relationships, although those old relationships were put into a different pers- perspective by the ginger spare Prince Harry, et cetera, this week. But however, I think you'll see that relationship, especially with Rishi Sunak as prime minister, mm-hmm. um, brought in. I think uh, Japan has always wanted in. And um, that's, you, pro- that's- you, pro- you probably have seen, Nicholas, that the U.S. announced uh, that we're forming something called the Quad Fund. I actually sit yeah. on the advisory board. I know you do. That's, that's absolutely that's- it's the it's the quad uh, getting together uh, to transcend administrations to put together a grand strategy and grand plan on how to compete technologically uh, and and militaristically with China and it's the quad and its friends and uh, it's being driven by the White House itself so this is something that's very important. So here's a question for you, Carl, that I have. Sorry, Jack, I've I've got this one question that I've been dying to because I haven't spoken to Carl for a while. Yeah, yeah. Does she survive? I mean, I think I think he pushes China into. Uh, there's no doubt that he moves on Taiwan, uh, and I think that uh, it depends what our re- retaliatory response is. I think we should remove all of the SOE banks, joint stock banks from the from the SWIFT uh, system, and we can collapse their economy in uh, in a matter of months or maybe even weeks. Yeah. Uh, and he won't survive that. Uh, but, but I can tell you, I'm not sure if we're willing to press that button. We have that button. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you guys, I, um, Kyle, just cause I know we're, we're a bit short on time. I just want to do kind of a, a lightning round. So, uh, Nick and Kyle, I'm going to throw some commodities out, out and tell me which you think will perform the best and which we think will perform the worst in 2023. Why? Coal, natural gas, oil, copper, uranium, and iron or steel. Uh, Kyle, you first, and then Nick. All right, so just just choose one for next year. One best is one the worst, but you can also comment on the other one too. Sure. So so tell me FOB where. So for instance, you know, uh, you mean LNG cargoes Asia, or do you mean uh, Henry Hub prices in America? Uh, I was thinking Henry Hub, yeah. Um, hmm. Uh, as a percentage, and this is by the end of twenty twenty three, huh? Yes. Yes. Um, I think. Uh, hmm. 
That's a tie. It's a tie up in my mind between oil and nat gas. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'll go with nat gas. Okay. That, that was the one I was going to go with. And, and okay. how about I, the I was tempted with uranium, but it's been so long at a graveyard yep. trade. Um, That's 10 years out. Yeah, I agreed. That's 10 years out. Uh, and the worst, did you say you wanted the worst? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all going to do pretty well. Uh, I, uranium, uranium may do the worst because, uh, you know, we're not going to make those long-term decisions to build nuclear yet. Yeah, I think I, I would tend to agree. Even though it's in the shortest supply next year, it might do the worst. Yeah. I mean, right, thanks. My, my next uh, lightning round question is yeah. how high do you think the Federal Reserve gets uh, right now that the peak is 4%? What's priced in is uh, just under 5%. Uh, Nick, you first and uh, Kyle, then you. And also, please, please share why, you know. Um, I think we've got 5%. Okay. And the reason I think. Wait, I, what do you say? 5%. Okay. We're going to, you know, we're going to be there early next year. Um, and we're both answering this. Jack, without seeing the latest dot plots. Um, I think 5%, and the reason I say that is, I think uh, it's going to be a slowdown path on rate hikes, okay? Um, And they won't consider cuts until they see at least three months of of trending down core inflation, core being their PCE measure, okay? Which is a little stickier than core CPI. Got it. Thanks. So 50 in December next week, or this, sorry, this week, uh, 25 in February, then 25 in March is your base case. Obviously everything can change. Kyle, what about you? Uh, 50 in December is all we get. Um, and then, then we start to see the impacts of the first hikes and we see the, the, I guess, alacrity of the situation at hand when we see housing's falling faster than it felt in the, in the GFC, you're seeing uh, consumer inventory numbers uh, falling at numbers that I've never seen before. So, and I know there are pockets of strength. I get it. There's still money sloshing around in the system, but um, I think we hike 50. I think that's it. And I think we're cutting rates before the end of next year. And Nicholas, I will, I will take double or nothing on our bet. If you want, <laughs> you want to take 475 as, as the, uh, as the, uh, end as, of the year. Well, as, as the, the host and someone who's in the middle, I, I'll be 475, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. Uh, well, 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 gentlemen, it, it's been great. So it just sounds in this year, it sounds like a uh, bull market in commodities of next year, not a great time for risk assets, a uh, stocks. What about bonds? Uh, do you think like the 10-year treasury will be lower or higher than it is right now uh, by you know the, the last day of 2023? Uh, Nick, then Kyle. Quite a, bit lower. Quite a bit lower. Um, quite a bit lower. Quite a bit lower because of... I, either the positive outcome, Chinese deflation, because the consum- the international consumer is still looking good, or the negative outcome, which is a credit crunch. So I don't I, I, I don't see anything really in between. So both would be lead me to think, you know, lower tenure, two and a half, two and three quarters. Uh, um, I mean, by the end of next year, I'm not sure. You know, we got to like 420. On the ten year, and I thought that was the uh, the greatest time to pile in, uh, and I did. Uh, and um, I've I've since lightened up on that position because of how fast uh, bonds have rallied and, and rates have come down. So you're saying from here, I don't know, maybe flat around here by next year. But but to Nicholas's point, if the recession is as sharp as it's going to show, it could easily trade down to three. So again, I if I had to bet from here, I would say rates lower, price, prices higher. Hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you and thank you everyone for watching. Thank you.